Good morning, uh, Carrick Elam. It's great to be with you today, and you will have recognized I am not Andy, nor am I Mark, nor am I Scott. I am by far the most handsome of the four. <laughs> well, there's the first lab of the day out of the way. But it's great to be with you today. Uh, we're excited to meet again for another Sunday. You know, uh, I, I've been just thinking over uh, the last few months how this uh, medium of uh, television and, and online service coming to you in your home has been a real blessing, a real godsend. And without it, where would we have been? How would we have got through the last year? But praise God, in his planning and in his purpose and in his provision, he made a way so that you this morning can be here. It's great that you're joining with us from the comfort of your living room. I'm glad you're here. And hopefully in the next few weeks, you'll be able to make your way back at least periodically for fellowship in the church. We're glad, we would love to see you. Remember, if you're coming, you gotta book in online. So this morning, uh, I'm just gonna open a little word of prayer and then we're gonna have some announcements. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your great faithfulness. Lord, thank you that while we were still sinners, not only did you see us in our sin, not only did you recognize us as being lost, but you stepped in, you reached out, and you saved us. Lord, thank you today that we are trophies of your grace, loved by you, held by you, and sustained by you. And God, I pray today that wherever we are, whatever aspect of life we find ourselves in, Lord, that we would know your presence and your peace and your great comfort, that there would be joy in our spirits, that we are not alone but that you're with us and we are loved by God. So Lord, bless those who are struggling today. Help those who are weak today. And Lord, most of all, may your glory shine in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I pray that you've said a great amen. Well, some announcements uh, this morning, just as we jump into these. Uh, uh, we, uh, I've already said, if you're, if you're coming to church, remember to sign up. We have two services, a 10 a.m. service and an 11.30 service and you can uh, go onto the Facebook site or onto the, the website and you'll be able to just sign up, uh, fill in the register and send it. You'll get a little response on the Saturday night to say you're in and we would love to have you come along to that. Um, also, uh, a new addition, um, restrictions are slightly lifted and we are able to have Sunday school at the 11.30 service. So if the reason you weren't coming is because, well, my children won't sit, you can sign up and fill in the little section that says how many are coming and you're really welcome at the 11.30 service. Number one tip, get in early because it fills up quickly, but we would love to see you. Uh, Bible study this week. Um, I love Bible study. Uh, it's, in, it's in a smaller group setting and we get to discuss all of the things that we talk about throughout the services uh, on a Sunday. And you know, sometimes uh, church can be very one directional. The pastor stands or the preacher stands and shares what they think and they understand it to be true. But there's no way to reflect back. There's no way to ask questions or to share what you think. We'll come to Bible study because we do all of that. And it's a real place to grow. I want to encourage you, 7.30 on Wednesday night, you can come here. You don't have to sign up beforehand. You sign up when you come in. But I can guarantee you'll be blessed. You'll pray. We'll sing a short time together. And we will discuss what has been looked at this morning by Philip. So please come along to that. Also, on Friday nights, we have a merge, 7.30, here in the building. You can contact Abby or Andy uh, for all those who are between 11 years old and 21 years old. It's a great time. My kids come and they love it. They, they kind of are excited every week to be here. Um, so please uh, come along. If you've got teenagers in your house and they're kind of sitting about doing nothing, ask them, would you like to be involved? And get them to book in and come along. Over the last year, uh, we have been blessed, amazed, touched, uplifted by your generosity. Personally, I want to say thank you. Thank you for giving. Thank you for remembering that part of our commitment to God and part of our service to the church is to give. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. He actually loves a generous giver. And that's you. I want to thank you for your generosity. Remember, if you're giving, um, still the best way to do it in the COVID world is online. You can set up a standing order at the bank. You can use the Give It Up or, or there's even a little text. And if you happen to be coming to the building, then you can give into the collection place. But thank you. Thank you for your generosity and may God bless you. If you need uh, 
a visitor, you need someone to talk to. Um, I'm your man, by the way, that's my job. And uh, you can contact me on johnny at carrickelamchurch.co.uk. Um, and let me encourage you. Because sometimes when people contact me, they say, Pastor, I, I don't want to waste your time. You're not. Or it's only something small. It doesn't matter. I would love just to, to spend some time and to pray with you. So please ask. I was reading in James chapter 5 the other day, and it says, if anyone is sick, let him call the elders. Call the elders. If you're sick, give me a call, and I would love to visit with you. Lastly, um, and we've said this the whole way through, there are three things that we have set out at the start of our mission online. Number one is that you would be connected to the church online. You would be connected through these wonderful ways of communication. That you would connect with others. You would remember those around you. The second thing is that you would remain or be positive in your life uh, goal to reach the loss and, and therefore your connection with the church would go into the community. And the final thing is that you would be connected with God. That's the number one thing, that you are connected with God. And I pray that you would continue to do that. We send out information on a mailing list. There's little text messages go out just to keep you connected into what's happening. If you don't receive those, send me an email, johnnycarrickelamchurch.co.uk and we'll get you on the list. We would love to keep you connected. So stay connected with each other, stay connected to the church and mostly stay connected with God. I've got some verses that I would just really love to read this morning. It's from the Psalms, and you all know I love the Psalms. Psalm 121, there are eight verses, verses one to eight. And the Psalmist writes this, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? He's asking a question. My help comes from the Lord, the one who made the heavens and the earth. He will not allow my foot to slip. For he who watches over uh, you will never slumber nor sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He goes on and he says, The Lord watches over you. For the Lord is your shade at, the, uh, at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. For the Lord watch will watch over you in your coming and in your going. Both now, today, and forevermore tomorrow. Psalm 121. Take time this week to read it and consider it. May God bless you. Have a great day.
his trumpet sound Oh, he's coming Oh, may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Whom could imagine? So great a mercy What heart could fathom Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross is
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the This kind of greeting, slightly formal, um, has many other options. Uh, we here in Northern Ireland might say, how you doing? How's things? You okay? And they, they are not really inquiries into how you are doing. They're just an exchange of a greeting. And one of the most or more recent ones is all good. And Every time I hear that, <coughs> um, my mind goes in the direction of does the person mean my behaviour and moral character? Or does the person mean that I have scored highly in some test that I've done? Or is it just the equivalent to how you're doing? I think it's the equivalent of how you're doing. 
But the truth is, if somebody were to say to me, all good, <coughs> and I wanted to answer them truthfully, I would have to say, no, all is not good. We are complex beings. There are many parts to us, many departments to us. And the Bible identifies being human as someone who has a body, a mind, a heart, soul and spirit. There are many parts to us. <clears throat> and within that, you've got your emotions, your will, process of thinking, reflecting, awareness of right and wrong. We are complex characters. So when someone says, all good, they've opened up a box of looking at all those compartments of our lives. And the answer is, no, all is not good. And the truth is that while on earth, it will never all be good. Um, we have got a heart that can have strong desires for the right thing and the wrong thing. We have a decision-making process called the will, which can decide for the right thing and the wrong thing. We have a body that can be used for good purposes and bad purposes. That is it. We are people of um, at least two dimensions in all of those areas. The reason it can never all be good now in those compartments, that is to say, the reason that we will not always only think the right thing, but also do the right thing, that won't happen. The reason that all of our strong desires will not be good, some will be bad, and some will get, we'll give in to. The reason for that is that sin has affected all of these parts of our bodies. It is a kind of current thing <clears throat> to want to address mindfulness. Um, people in organizations have a duty of care. <clears throat> we want to think about if there are such things as moral absolutes, if there's always a right and always a wrong. And we see that there's a connection between what we think, what our emotions are doing, and how our body responds. And what we are thinking and feeling can affect how our bodies are functioning. As to how our bodies are, whether in good or bad health, can affect our emotions and our thoughts. They're interconnected. <clears throat> in the book of Proverbs, a book written by um, a man who was given an extraordinary and supernatural gift of wisdom above all other people, name was Solomon. And he writes a description of these connections, these connecting effects of parts of our body. He said this in Proverbs 13, 12. <clears throat> Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope is something in your mind. Heart is what you aspire to. When hope isn't realized, you go down. You're affected by this. So he said a thing which is very true, very accurate. <clears throat> what we think will affect how we feel. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Now I know this is a bit like saying grass is green, but I'm just trying to point to you, out to you that we have compartments to our lives, each affecting the other, and that never will all be good. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. So when we're dealing with people through perhaps counselling or uh, various therapies, um, cognitive therapies or whatever, um, the, the attempt to deal with all of these compartments of our lives, our mind, our heart, our body, and the interconnection between these, very, very hard to do, to deal with all of those. Anxiety in man's heart wears him down. That happens to a Christian. But a good word makes him glad. 
So his emotions and strong feelings can be affected and helped by a good and positive word. Another statement Solomon made was, A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh. In other words, if your heart's desires are good and you're at peace with them, it gives life to the flesh. It's invigorating. It helps you move on. It gives you a drive. But another thing that your thoughts can do is be as to have a negative effect on your body. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Another statement he made where it was, kind words are like a life-giving tree, but lying words will crush your spirit. That is to say, they will take away the desire to keep trying. And there's no doubt that as thing as basic as telling the truth <clears throat> to another person, whether it's a working relationship, <clears throat> pardon me, a working relationship or a family relationship, truth is absolutely a core value and really should be preserved. As kind words give life, so a lying word can crush a spirit. So you can see that there are circumstances, there are relationships, there are actions we can take, all interconnected and all can affect us. Result, we go up and down. Sometimes we feel good, think positively and are motivated. And other times, because those things get affected, we are unmotivated. We don't feel good and we can feel quite anxious and fearful. I do believe we can get help to an extent from things like counselling, from cognitive therapies, and as far as body and mind are concerned, even medication. And I think successful medical interventions have been able to transform people's lives. Like this vaccine that's going around, whichever one you feel comfortable with, has made a difference. It has lifted people's spirits. It has made them feel less vulnerable. Better health is probably top of the list for feeling good generally about your day. Illness, and particularly prolonged illness, can be very depleting, very wearing. Change of environment and circumstances can be of help. If you're in a situation where you're feeling overwhelmed and overpowered by something, change those circumstances and you will probably think and feel better. Improve financial issues. Debt. I absolutely loathe debt. I, it, it causes me to, be, to genuinely feel down. Um, obviously, I've gotten into debt for various things like buying a house or whatever. But it is the unnecessary debt that can be avoided, which I feel is just such a weight. Improved relationships. We are social beings. Very few of us are hermits. Very few of us are isolates. <clears throat> we are people who like some company, if not more gregarious types who like lots of company. But as soon as you have a relationship with someone, you know you run the risk of misunderstanding. <clears throat> you run the risk of disagreement. You run the risk of personality clash. And so relationships, no matter how wonderful, are at risk of being damaged and undermined and broken. And it actually would go so far, would go so far as to say that even if a person had been amazingly successful and had achieved great things, whether it was in the world of business, the world of academia, the world of sport, the world of research, whatever, whatever great success a person has had, things go reasonably well when you've had success, but the heart, the human heart, is that is not enough for the human heart to be settled. Nothing at the moment, is ever absolutely right. Final thing Solomon said, <clears throat> even in laughter, the heart may ache. 
Even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. I'm going to reduce that down to what I think makes sense. Every single thing we have in life, we're going to lose. And if it doesn't get lost at our death, it will be lost on the way. And the result? That even in laughter the heart may ache. No matter how happy and joyful you feel, there is an inner awareness that whatever has been making you happy and joyful is temporary. And your heart can ache. And even at the end of joy, there can be grief. So Solomon looked at all of the departments of life, saw how interconnected they are, and if he were asked, <laughs> jokingly, all good, he would say no. It's a very complex thing to be human, and it's a very challenging issue. Sin is uh, an issue to deal with all of our, our departments and capacities. So sin has changed everything. Everything that is good and pleasing and enriching and which we value and cherish will end. They will go from us or we will go from them. <clears throat> so, is there a way to deal with this? I think the Bible actually doesn't just tell you what the problem is, but it offers a quite incredible solution. And the solution to all of this lack, <clears throat> all of this fragility, all of this changeable uh, way that we are, how you can have really good things happening in one department of your life and difficult things happening in another. To be born again by the Spirit of God is the biggest and greatest step toward the fullness of life that God wants us to have. First step. Having been born again, to have the Holy Spirit with us, to have the Holy Spirit always with us, to have the Holy Spirit enable us to believe God, to have the Holy Spirit enable us to trust and hope in God, to have the Holy Spirit enable us to rejoice in God, to make God our treasure, to make him our greatest devotion and comfort. Now, why is this a fix? It is because God is the only being who loves and cares and comforts and comes into our lives by his very presence, by his Spirit. And he goes to meet what our heart's desires are and seeks to change them toward him. He goes to meet what our minds think and be anxious about and tells us he cares and provides. He comes to our bodies and says it will not always be like this. The great words of Paul were summed up when God told him in a circumstance where he was wanting it changed. He says the circumstance is going to stay but my grace will be sufficient. That's a, that's a powerful thing. That's a, this isn't cognitive therapy. This is supernatural divine activity. Those other things can go a distance. But it is this which makes the inner change that's necessary for the full life. Jesus described this process. And he did so <clears throat> at the end of what is known as the Sermon on the Hill or the Sermon on the Mount. One of the greatest open air events a person could ever have gotten to. Story of two builders, one wise, one foolish, two houses, two different foundations. You're familiar with it. I'm going to read a bit of it to you. He, so he just finished this Sermon on the Mount. Amazing set of teaching. <clears throat> and he said this. Everyone who hears these words and puts them into practice. Oh, puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house 
on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. First thing, and you'll read this. Both houses had the same conditions that hit them. This phrase is for both houses. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. A Christian will experience exactly the same troubles in life that a non-Christian will. The house on the rock is the Christian. The house on the sand is the non-Christian. But the same storms come. The same troubles come. The same challenges come. The same issues have to be faced as someone who's not a Christian. Same thing. But one house is going to stand. And one house is going to fall. And as Jesus said, great will be its collapse. So everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man. I think of all the characteristics that uh, I struggle with, that's an exaggeration, of the characteristics I struggle with. What I know I should do and what I actually do, there's a gap. There's a gap. I know that Jesus said he came to give life and life in all its fullness. I know he said that. I am aware of what way I should be living in order to experience that. But there's a gap between what I know and what I do. It's just part of the um, tension that exists between where God's spirit wants to bring me and where my fleshly selfishness wants to bring me. I'm going to live with that until I die. And so, so are you, whether you're a Christian or not. Well, you, well I shouldn't say a Christian or not. If you're a Christian, you're going to live with that until you die. Even with yourself being on this foundation. However, I can't get round the thought that I weaken myself when I don't deny myself and follow Jesus. When I fail to repent but want to hold on to something I'm doing wrong. When I keep myself from experiencing God's help and power when I fail to go to him, when I fail to seek him. When I think I can survive on a starvation diet of virtually no prayer and no Bible reading, I know I am weakening myself. And at times when I have done that, what has happened is that the ugly side to me of intolerance and greed and lust and anger and impatience and being unkind and being covetous and being jealous those things rise to the surface and demonstrate themselves and manifest themselves in my life the only way i can keep those things from being dominant is by the power of the holy spirit and he has been given to every christian and it is insane that I do this at times. But my recovery lies in my coming to the throne of heavenly grace to receive mercy. And mercy is what I need because I've done the wrong thing. And I can go to the throne of heavenly grace to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's where my recovery lies. That's where my source of power lies. And when Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount dealt with these human issues in great detail, he described the Christian life. He described the necessary good path for marriage. He pointed out the awfulness of adultery, whether practiced in a person's mind. He talked about the um, disapproving way God has uh, of his attitude toward divorce. He described how our relationships have to be about being forgiving, that revenge is up to God, and that we do not have to pursue this revenge issue but can take justice through the courts. 
He's explained that you need to have, you need to understand your heart will want to set itself on things. He encouraged us to set our, set our hearts on things. And he said, set them on things in heaven, not earth. He said, you will become anxious. You live an uncertain life, you can't see round corners. But you have a heavenly Father who knows all things. And I can assure you, said Jesus, he will provide. He will look after you. Do not be anxious. And then he said, this teaching, the person who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice will be like a house built on the rock. And he went on to say, as I've read, that everyone who hears his words and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Now I know you might say, what about Dubai? I've watched two programs about Dubai. Buildings are built on the sand. But the thing is, they all have boundaries of millions of tons of concrete. So the sand can't go anywhere. That's my understanding of them. They didn't have concrete in Jesus' day, so it was on the sand, the wind came, the rain took it away, the streams took it away, and it did collapse. However, it says it fell with a great crash. I think there are two dimensions to this. If a person chooses to live with a life without God <clears throat> and handle all these things themselves, I think they will have a great crash. And if a person goes through life, does not become a Christian, does not allow themselves to be rescued by God, does not allow themselves the experience of God coming into their lives and living by the power of his Spirit, then the afterlife will be an unthinkable disaster. These two options stand before us. As Christians, we, we will have to deal with things, but we will deal with them in the power of God. As a non-Christian, the offer is there for you to experience this too. So is all good? No. But can we experience great things as God touches all parts of our lives? Yes, because Jesus said he came to give life and life in all its fullness. Only in heaven will it be perfect, but for the present time his grace is enough, and the water which he gives, his Holy Spirit, Jesus said the person who drinks of this water, symbolically, will never thirst again. Lord, we thank you for your truth. Help us to be convinced about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Philip, for sharing with us this morning. Now, as we come to the end of our time together, let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would bless us and keep us and sustain us. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you, as we read in Psalm 121 earlier, that you watch over us, that you support us, that you sustain us, and that you are the one who protects and provides for us. And Lord, I pray today that as we go, we will walk into this week with that knowledge. So Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love. Lord, help us to walk as those who have been set free through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week. May God bless you in all that you're doing. And we will see you next week. God bless. <laughs>